Hello and welcome to the Energy Connect studio at Future Energy Summit and Exhibition in Bangkok. I'm delighted to have joining me in the studio today, Julian Perez, the Managing Director of OGCI or the Oil and Gas Climate Initiative. Julian, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Sharon. Very pleased to be with you. Thank you. To start off, why should methane emissions be treated as seriously as oil spills or even more? And there's been a host of recent uh, initiatives around methane emissions such as the aiming for zero uh, methane emissions. Could you talk to us more about that? Yes, sure. So maybe to set the scene first, uh, you know, methane emission is a very potent greenhouse gas. Uh, it has, you know, a much warmer potential than the uh, CO2. But at the same time, the good thing with methane is that it does not stay very long in the atmosphere. So if you cut the flow of methane emission going into the atmosphere, you can reduce the stock very quickly. And so that's why it's uh, important for uh, to act on methane emission. This is what the International Pipeline on Climate Change or the International Energy Agency are putting so much emphasis as well on reduction of methane emissions because it has the potential to slow down the global warming we are experiencing today. Methane is responsible for one third of this global warming. So what we have been doing uh, on OGCI is that we have first set you know, a collective targets at 0.2%. Uh, which is now becoming an industry standard, has been reused by regulators as well or by NGOs as a best practice to be below 0.2% of leakage of methane emission across the gas value chain. And uh, thanks to that target and other actions that we've been doing collectively, we have managed to reduce our methane emission by uh, half between 2017 and today. The flaring emission, which is also linked with some, some kind of methane emissions, has been also reduced by 45% over the same period. So uh, this has been demonstrating that it's possible to reduce methane emissions first. The second thing that we've been doing as well is to invest through the climate investments uh, into technologies uh, that can help to detect and mitigate methane emissions uh, and deploy those technologies to prove that they are working. And we've done that as well through a satellite program that we have been launching in Iraq first and then testing it in Kazakhstan, Egypt, as well as in Algeria. So monitoring some very specific assets, informing the local operator that we have detected something and helping them to fix uh, the methane emissions. And this is working very well, to be honest. Uh, it's quite demanding in camera sources, but we have fixed very, very significant plumes. And so now we are extending that to probably eight countries. We are still figuring out the list of countries that we're gonna, we're gonna focus on. But with di different aspects, we feel that there is it's possible to get as close as possible to zero methane emission. And this is why we launched as well, this aiming for zero methane emissions. And to go back to your question on why should we treat it as seriously as oil spills, it's basically to change the mindset of the industry and say, yes, it's possible. And look at methane as seriously as you look at oil spills. So with a t zero tolerance mindset, mm -hmm. doesn't mean that you're gonna get to zero methane emission every year, but at least you put in place the processes the capex allocation, the training programs uh, to enable your assets to deal with methane emission as seriously as they deal with oil spills. So this is the, the, the big effort that we've been conducted over the last 10 years. That's an excellent point. And just diving a little deep into that, there's already a lot of momentum around these initiatives, but also there's a plenty of deadlines to, to uh, catch up, especially around 2030. So what's your forecast for, especially for this decade? Well, on methane emission specifically, yes. uh, well, I think the thing that we have observed, because we have a foot in the technology space, a foot in the industry and a foot in the policy, what we have been seeing is that there's a growing momentum and there is this kind of magic moment, I would say, in a market where all of a sudden the technology is there, the awareness is there, the policy is there. And so there's all the components to really address the methane emission in a very fast fashion now. Uh, so I, I'm quite hopeful that by the decade uh, we're going to see significant reduction of methane emission because the technology is mature. You probably heard that at the COP28, uh, Dr. Sultan, so the COP president, uh, has made uh, an announcement about the oil and gas decarbonization charter. This charter is bringing along now more than 50 companies, 50 uh, company, uh, to align on a set of climate agenda. Uh, including on methane. It's not only limited to methane, there's also a component about 
you know, reducing scope one and two, but also investing in a transition, in a renewable, in hydrogen and so on. But if we zoom in on the methane space, they are calling the 50 companies to get to, 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 to follow the aiming for zero methane emission mindset. So get as close as possible to zero, uh, using the 0.2% for instance, as an example of how you can estimate to, to be close to zero uh, methane emissions. And across those 50 companies, two thirds of them are national companies because those are the ones that are actually are really driving the market. And so it's very important that we bring them along because when you bring the NOC, you bring the government as well. And most of the time, those NOCs as well as are positioned in the global south, which is generally like the part of the world that is not necessarily part of the climate agenda. So, so I'm, I'm very hopeful for, for the decade to come that we're going to have a much better set of data of methane um, and also because of public satellites that have been launched, EDF, Methansat, it's going to help a lot on this. Uh, but also that this information will enable the operator to reduce their methane emissions significantly. Absolutely. And it's great that, you know, you spoke about the oil and gas decarbonization charter and the, the, I think the 52 or 53 companies that are taking part. And obviously, apart from methane emissions, a big part of that was on decarbonization. And that conversation has amplified increasingly after COP28. So what are your thoughts on the role of uh, CCS and how do you see that evolving? Yeah, so so I think, you know, so the, the oil and gas decarbonization charter, as you said, is bringing along 53 companies. Uh, but you, you got the right number. I was talking about more than 50, but 53 is the exact number. Uh, there's probably going to be a growing set of companies because the charter is not, you know, fine, set in stone in terms of membership. Uh, and actually, the COP president has asked OGCI to be the implementation partner. So we are very deep ends in uh, running this, this initiative. Um, if we set aside the methane emissions, which is half of the scope one and two of the oil and gas industry, it's two gigaton of CO2 equivalent that we're talking about. So it's a significant part. The other components of the charter indeed include CCUS. And I think, you know, there's no climate model today that are reaching net zero emissions by 2050 that does not have a significant part of CCUS. And the more we progress on the climate agenda, the more we realize that actually CCUS is gonna be extremely important, both for source point emissions, but also as for direct air capture. Uh, that requires quite a significant investment in terms of infrastructure to you know, move the CO2 and store it, uh, but also to cap capture it. So what we've been doing in this space, because this is another big component agenda of OGCI and will be a big component of the OGDC uh, going forward, is that we have scanned uh, 52 countries to identify where are the source of emissions that could uh, benefit from the implementation of a CCUS project. So I'm not talking about one cement plant or one steel industry with one CCUS project. It's more like industrial hubs. Yeah. We have like multiple dozens of industrial sites that collectively emit sufficient amount of CO2 emissions with a sufficiently good quality and thanks to our knowledge as well on the storage uh, capacity in those different regions, we're able to you know, dimension the first economic analysis of what, what the kind of project could make sense. And there's quite a number of them actually that make sense. And since then, uh, a number of OGCI companies have been scaling up uh, big projects. So they are involved in, uh, I think, 40 projects to date uh, with a potential to reduce by 300 million tons of CO2 equivalent per year starting from 2030, so it's, it's a significant number. And also the economics of scale that it's going to bring because it's going to reduce the cost of CCUS for the rest of the world as well. Um, and if I give you like very specific example, you have Teesside Valley in the UK, which is quite major now, Northern Lights, very big project as well. Uh, you have other projects in the US as well that benefits from a good combination of policy and technology provider mm -hmm. in place. So it's a kind of you know, I've been working in the renewable energy space for quite some time before joining your GCI. And for me, we're more or less seeing the same signal of the markets as we've seen at the renewable energy, i.e. you have technology provider, policy maker, a sense of urgency, and also, um, you know, for, for the emitter, the awareness that this technology is available and can be used as part of their climate journey. It's not like a, the bread and butter of the climate solution. It doesn't mean that we can continue to emit as we used to do. We have to mitigate methane emissions, but for the one that will be hard to abate, CCUS can be a significant game changer. And you raised a very critical point about uh, market signals. And you know, going with that flow, 
what kind of appetite do you see for low carbon fuels and let's say products such as hydrogen in the industry? Yeah, so uh, very interesting point because uh, there's a bit of a hype around, uh, you know, a low carbon fuel and hydrogen for good reasons. Uh, clearly, it can be part of the solution for specific segments uh, of the industry. So, you know, the connection with the CCUS is obviously on e-fuels such as e-kerosene or e-methanol that can provide, you know, some significant solution for, again, hard to abate sectors such as the maritime industry or the airline industry or the, uh, the heavy duty, you know, vehicle, the trucks, uh, which will require alternative fuels uh, that uh, could be these e-fuels. On hydrogen, we, we see it as, as well as good market potential again for the maritime industry because e-methanol combine both carbon capture and uh, low carbon hydrogen. So there's going to be like very specific market where those solutions will become probably more useful and more dominant because it doesn't require like a full change of the engines, of the infrastructure, uh, but can be, you know, a switch uh, of fuels. So what we've been doing in this space, because it's another uh, area of our agenda, is more to scale up the demand for those kind of, of uh, low carbon fuels. So again, e-fuels or hydrogen, and looking at their potential in those, those markets. But you have to take it from a regional angle as well here, because you can have like a, the global picture and having like some oversight, you know, globally that it makes sense. But then you, it's necessary to zoom in on very specific areas, Asia or Latin America, or Europe or US uh, to really be quite, um, how can I say, bring some value add to, to the conversation rather than being a little bit too much theoretical. Uh, so good potential for very specific market, I think. That's a fair point. And you've recently been appointed the managing director for OGCI. Many congratulations for that. Thank you. And could you give us an overview and some updates on you know how OGCI, which brings together some of the world's biggest oil and gas companies is accelerating action for a net zero future. Yeah, I think, you know, there's a bit of a standard sentence that you can hear all the time that uh, climate change is a global issue and it requires global answers. And I totally concur with that. But, you know, then you need to scratch a little bit below this sentence to really understand what does it mean in terms of concrete actions. So we bring together, as you say, uh, 12 companies at the CEO level. It's a CEO led initiative, uh, ultimately. Uh, both IOCs, so you know, big European companies, big US companies, but very importantly, NOCs. Uh, it was when we launched OGCI at the UN Climate Summit in 2014, it was the first time that many of those NOCs were taking a step into the climate agenda publicly. And so since then, what we've been seeing is that, you know, joint projects, sharing of best practices, sharing of knowledge in a very intense way, because we're a very, a very demanding initiative for our member, uh, help and accelerate significantly the reduction. So I've told you about, you know, the, the, the results that we gain through the methane emissions, because this has been in our agenda for 10 years uh, now. And so, you know, reducing by half the methane emission from the members, well, they were starting from a very low point already. is quite significant. And this is why we're now expanding it through the aiming for zero, or we're very glad for the COP28 to have given us the you know, the role, a role of implementation partner for the OGDC, because this gives us like a, a legitimate outreach to, to 50 companies mm -hmm. now. Um, but we've done also on the scope one and two, for instance, defining like joint target as well, uh, which are, we're trying to disseminate now through the, through the industry, but also pushing our member to invest into low carbon solution. To give you uh, some numbers of all the past, the past five years, uh, the 12 OGCI companies have invested 65 billions in uh, low carbon solutions, i.e. renewable hydrogen CCUS, uh, to make it simple. Uh, and the last year was the biggest year, like more than 20 billion was invested across the 12 companies. If we manage to do that across the 50 companies of OGDC, and then by ripple effect influence the rest of the industry, because the OGDC is only 40% of the industry, so 60% are not member of OGDC. I mean, this can be a game changer in the climate agenda because that's, that will put the oil and gas industry as a positive actor, as a multi-energy companies uh, to address the climate challenge rather than only be part of the issue. Absolutely. And you spoke about COP28 and the momentum that's generated from there, as well as OGCI's critical role in implementing the charter. So can we look forward to an update at COP29? Well, we will have to, uh, to be honest, because uh, you know OGDC has been launched at the COP 
So we feel that it's now our drum beats to some extent that we have to come back at every single COP uh, with some news. Uh, so as part of the OGDC, uh, our role, first of all, will be to be a, a platform to connect the companies between themselves with the best practice as well outside of the industry, uh, with NGOs, with UN system. Uh, that's our main job, actually, is to make sure that particularly NOCs coming from Africa, from Southeast Asia, that are not necessarily used to be part of this kind of discussion and clubs, uh, feel confident that we can play that role of connecting them uh, with, with this kind of, uh, of entity. So we'll be doing quite a number of capacity building, training programs, uh, workshops in different regions to start building the trust, building this momentum and the spirit of collaboration. Uh, this is a very key component of the OGDC. But the other part as well is that uh, we've uh, put in place a governance system where uh, we would like to, to track and monitor the progress that each of the OGDC signatories are making against the goal of the Charter. Not to finger point the bad one, but rather to emphasize the good one and making sure that this initiative keeps its integrity ultimately because uh, you know, we've, there's been a promise, a promise to the world and now we have to deliver on it. So that's a very, very key component. And so hopefully you'll hear about us at COP29, COP30 and all the following COPs. Absolutely. And like you said, I think monitoring and implementation will be the key. Yeah. Now that there are all the boxes are ticked and the plans are in place. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Julian, thank you so much for joining us. And thanks for your superb insights and analysis. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you. A big thank you to all those watching and a quick reminder to follow us on our LinkedIn and other social media channels. I'll be back with more guests in the next episodes of the Energy Connect discussions. But until then, goodbye.